show you this. In fact, I need to pull on my glasses to be able to. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm not too embarrassed about that. Uh, but you know, indications for for egg freezing are are, are many, and they're, the the indications are really expanding with time because of the fact that you know new personal reasons are evolving. It's not just what do I think as a medical professional that you need, but it's a lot of what I think as a patient. You know, I'm telling you what I think. I want to take advantage of your services in such and such a way that are more personal. And I think that's important. I mean, there's two sides to the table, right? There's always what we believe and we feel is, is good for you and what you feel is good for yourself as a patient. And, you know, it's important that you know, people understand what we do and how we do it so they can apply it to their own situations. And we see that a lot in the world of reproductive medicine and, uh, and fertility preservation because I can't possibly understand everything there is to know about those, that, that couple uh, or that patient and, you know, what they're experiencing and put myself in their shoes only to some degree. And it's important for them to be able to say, I understand what you do, here's how I want to avail myself of that, of those services. And you, you, you know, you really work together to uh, be able to provide those things to, to meet their interests and needs. So, you know, the, the indications for egg freezing or fertility preservation are multiple now. Uh, the family history of, of premature menopause, interesting because we now recognize that um, when your mother uh, undergoes menopause or when you undergo menopause, um, as defined by inability to reproductive function because of loss of eggs, then we recognize that that has implications for your kids. Um, and we recognize that, uh, you know, this now, if you're someone in your family, uh, mother specifically, um, underwent premature menopause, and that's going to influence what, what you uh, are likely to do. And uh, also, it's going to have implications about what your interests are for future fertility. Um, you know, if you're not married, don't have a life partner, uh, if you're pursuing career or educational goals, I mean, these are different things. People delaying childbearing for various reasons, personal reasons again. Um, you're not financially ready to have children, but are interested in future fertility again, similar vein of, of just personal interests. Um, you're not prepared to have a second child. I mean, I see this a lot in different ways where, you know, gosh, I, I, I have diminishing fertility capacity now based upon certain evaluations that we can do to estimate patients' reproductive potential. And then projecting forward, gosh, I want to have three kids. Uh, you know, but yet uh, right now my capacity for fertility preservation is limited or for fertility is limited right now three years from now or five years from now when I want to have that second or third child. It affects how you think about things. Um, cancer, of course, which is what we're going to specifically talk about more. Uh, but, um, you know, other medical conditions that you don't necessarily think about, like endometriosis, severe advanced endometriosis, where the looming probability of hysterectomy, for example, is, is a real concern. Um, certain autoimmune diseases, severe lupus, uh, some of these things not necessarily so common, but those patients do get uh, chemotherapy, and that does affect fertility potential. Um, you know, even if it is you know low dose methotrexate, for example, for for a period of months and months, it, it does affect ovarian function. Um, so, and, and you know, this is a big one down here at the bottom that you can't read, and I'm having, having a hard time standing here, but it's diminished ovarian reserve at a young age. We see this a lot. I mean, uh, diminished ovarian reserve is a real problem that we often find surreptitiously and, and, you know, by other incidental evaluation, we're getting an uh, assessment of uh, some uterine abnormality that was found on examination, and lo and behold, you assess the ovaries and discover that uh, this young patient doesn't have very many eggs. I mean, we just saw that today. Uh, it happens all the time, and, you know, that's a life-changing thought that someone who's, you know, 25 years old, thinking, gosh, why would I be even considering fertility? And next thing you know, you're telling them that they don't have very many eggs uh, that you just by chance found, and that's just a genetic factor. I, I, it happens literally on a 
daily basis. And, you know, partly, obviously, that's part of our population of patients that we see that are having problems, but, you know, now that we see just general gynecology patients, we see it even in this population, and uh, it, it's amazing. Uh, it's like the guys who just out of the blue come in with low sperm count. Same thing. I mean, it's women come in with low egg count, didn't know the difference, had no clue, or they find it by accident because they have irregular periods. Very common presentation, irregular periods. Why? Because they have diminished number of eggs. I mean, we see this all the time. Another indication to preserve fertility for the future. This is an impossible slide to see, so I'll just try to describe it to you, but it is, um, you know, the, the different strategies for preserving fertility, and it just describes egg fr freezing, uh, embryo uh, crowd preservation, uh, ovarian tissue uh, crowd preservation, and also using uh, Lupron, or what we call uh, GnRH uh, agonists, to um, reduce uh, the damage that chemotherapy can have to ovarian function. We'll talk about that more, but those are really the four main things of how do we manage, um, in general, fertility preservation. Um, I mean, again, impossible to see, but um, you know, critical points about fertility preservation, in, in specifically in cancer patients, one of the more common things that we encounter for people who are interested is that you know, because it's a process that it involves lots of people, we sort of touched on this, this team approach idea, uh, lots of people and various specialists, and because uh, this is an involved science with, uh, you know, rapidly changing available options to the patients or the couple, you know, the key is having an organized system with um, early initiation of providing this information. I mean, that's what's just key is us as a team being able to provide this information in a timely fashion so people can make decisions. You know, everything from how do you go about this process of uh, fertility preservation to you know, what are your options and choices, what are the costs, I mean, everything. And it's an involved conversation. I mean, it, it's no less than an hour to you know, discuss these things because there's just a lot of uh, things that have to be reviewed, you know, when oftentimes with cancer patients there's other things on the line. Um, in, in, in young patients, uh, the information is overwhelming. I mean, it just becomes sort of what you're describing when the doctor comes out and, uh, you know, the, your husband's had a mastectomy. And it's like, why, why are we discussing now my daughter? You know, um, in, in getting into that whole conversation, it, it's just a shock. And it's a shock to the system for these patients to, you know, be told one day that they have uh, breast cancer or some other type of hematologic cancer or you know, some other significant issue to say, you know, now I have to think about, you know, am I going to have babies? It's, it's a lot, but it requires them just taking a step back, sitting down, discussing this stuff. And if you can do that in a rapid fashion, it's just invaluable. Um, you know, I mean, this just is a slide that describes a study wherein they just basically are saying that you know, cancer chemotherapy, the traditional cytotoxic uh, cancer treatments that you all know about, I mean, it, it affects ovarian reserve, period. I mean, in, unfortunately, these studies often use amenorrhea, uh, absence of menstrual periods, as the indication of fertility reduction. So I don't have periods there. In other words, I'm already menopausal, you know, related to ovarian, the, the chemotherapy. You know, that's the far end of the spectrum. You know, we see patients that are just have diminished number of follicles and eggs. And, you know, that's the, that is a significant reduction in fertility. They don't have to be completely menopausal. I mean, that's sort of obvious. So using that sort of extreme example as the benchmark for, you know, chemotherapy causes, uh, you know, 30% of patients in some studies or 50% in other studies to have amenorrhea. Is, is unfortunately not addressing the real issues that, look, I mean, they may have tons of follicles and eggs. They're going to have less uh, after these treatments, radiation, chemotherapy, surgery. Um, I mean, and they may try to do things to reduce that. But you know what? It will affect uh, the ovarian reserve. 
and it may affect it so badly that they're now menopausal. It may affect it to the point where, you know, it's just a reduction in what they from what they had before. I mean, this is why it's so important to understand where does this individual stand. If they are already on the low end of the spectrum with regard to ovarian reserve, and they undergo chemotherapy, they're going to be absolutely menopausal and amenorrheic. If they have polycystic ovaries at the beginning of the chemotherapy, well, they're going to be reduced, but yet they may still be in a better place, um, you know, relative to the other person. You know, you, you can see it's this relative reduction in fertility potential based upon where they start, and that's really the critical thing that we do. First and foremost is to try to find out where is this person on that spectrum of ovarian reserve. Are they already diminished before they even get into it? That's a whole different scenario than a person who's got polycystic ovaries who fares better. The studies that you read out there don't differentiate that, and we shouldn't be feeling good about something that says, oh, you only have a 30% chance of, with this particular chemotherapy regimen, we shouldn't feel good about your 30% your chance that you're going to be infertile. I mean, that's just not true. It's always higher than that, and the same goes with guys who are getting chemotherapy for testicular cancer. They generally have uh, testicular dysfunction in, uh, anyway. Uh, but chemotherapy will, period, affect the, the ovarian reserve and ultimately the fertility. And it just depends on where they are on the spectrum before they start. This is a blurry slide, but in, uh, it's tough to read anyway, but I'll just review it. it you know, discussing these things uh, is always very helpful for, for the people. Uh, people generally, the patients, know this is a problem, and this just basically says, did you know chemotherapy caused sterility? 75% of the patients who were cancer patients, 75% sort of had this idea, yes, it, it does cause, quote, sterility. And, you know, 25% didn't, didn't really understand that and hadn't really thought about it, perhaps, whatever the case may be. Um, have you heard of fertility preservation uh, before? And amazingly, this seems high to me, but roughly 50% had heard that fertility preservation was an option or a thought. And in just even knowing that vague question, 50% didn't even recognize that this was a possibility. Um, have you... Uh, about this topic, and um, you know, 15% had thought about it a lot. 33% uh, had thought uh, about it somewhat, and 25% uh, or so a little, and the rest not at all. So you know, the majority of patients, you know, really kind of, but not really thought about it in the context of their own circumstances. That's what we hope to be able to address. And this is just another slide that the reason that you know, cancer patients, um, you know, do not undertake the process of fertility preservation. It's a small study. But, you know, a third of them, um, <coughs> well, we'll say that 40% or so did not do it because they just didn't have any information about it, and they just didn't really understand it. And, um, you know, they, they thought, uh, a third of them thought, well, it's just a hopeless situation. Why bother uh, idea, which is tough, and I'm sure you, you know the people involved in oncology see that all the time. And you know, 10%, um, you know, were concerned about delay, that fertility preservation would delay the treatment. Obviously, we're trying to work around that with with you know getting involved in an early time frame. And you know, 15%, uh, you know, thought that it might uh, influence their prospects of survival. Obviously, that's uh, not true, but, you know, uh, it's just a lot of misinformation or no information, unfortunately. Um, um, you know, this just is a, a, a diagram of sort of the typical idea that, hey, the oncologist is the one who initiates this uh, discussion that about fertility preservation. And I, I think this is sort of an old-school algorithm, because in my opinion, it's whoever makes the diagnosis and gets the piece of paper that comes from the biopsy, which is often the radiologist. Uh, that, you know, in today's world, the diagnosis is made by the surgeon who does a biopsy and finds the cancer before they get to the oncologist, 
or the radiologist now, so many of these biopsies are done in the radiology center for the breast cancer specifically, and uh, you know, a lot of times they're doing a mammogram, they see a problem that's highly suspicious, they call the surgeon or whomever and say, uh, the oncologist and say, look, we want to do a biopsy on your patient, would you prefer? They do it, you know, the, the doctor is sort of, uh, the, the preferring physician is a secondary influence. And, you know, then the point of diagnosis is at the radiology center. And, you know, to me, those are the people who would potentially breach or broach the subject with the patients and say, look, you know, just throw it out there. You need to discuss it. Don't be heavy-handed necessarily in the discussion and start getting into all these complex things. Just say, look, you ought to be talking to these people, and you ought to be considering this if it's a patient who, who is in a reasonably young age to have that discussion at least. And, you know, that's all we think. That's all that I think is, is important to say, look, just give them the information and say, hey, go talk to these people. Now, or somebody that's involved in the world of uh, reproductive medicine. Because, you know, in this particular uh, diagram, it's kind of down here at the bottom, speak to the fertility specialist. But again, I mean, so many times I would get a call on Friday afternoon saying, you know, I'm starting chemotherapy next week. And you just can't do anything for those people unless you can uh, talk them into delaying the process, which the, the naturally oncologists and, and people are just reticent to do, and understandably. But you know, they, it's it's like, well, when did you find out about this diagnosis? Well, two months ago when I was getting an MRI, or blah blah blah. It's like, well, that was the point at which we could have intervened and done a lot of different things. Um, so that's what you know. There's this sort of paradigm shift. I think is. Important to say, but this doesn't. The onus shouldn't necessarily always be on the oncologist. You know, sometimes they are the primary source, especially for other things like hematologic cancers. You know, but you know, solid tumors, breast cancer, namely in, in women. You know, it's a lot of it is the radiologists and surgeons you know, who are getting again the piece of paper or the suspicion based upon a, a biopsy, or, or for, they're getting the, the information that says here's the diagnosis. And that was a, just this case we had not long ago that, that it couldn't have happened any better. I mean, before she even saw the oncologist, she was in talking to us a week before that. Uh, it allowed us to say, look, if it works with your treatment plan, you know, here's what we can do to make this happen. And uh, as it turned out, we wanted to do two different procedures of egg retrieval because we had that time. But based upon other information that came in from her breast cancer diagnosis with staging and whatnot, they moved it up a month. You know, we were able to get one procedure in, which is fantastic. Two would have been golden, but at least we got that. And the chemotherapy and the treatment regimen, which is going to devastate her ovarian function, you know, was moved up a couple of weeks, and, uh, you know, there was our second opportunity lost. But, you know, hey, that, that's okay. You know, as it turns out, as good number of eggs and things. It was just great. It worked out great. And we got her in that day. You know, she called up. Boom. It, was, it couldn't have been any better. Uh, so, I mean, this, this sort of paradigm, sort of shifting the responsibility to, to the oncologist, I think, is can't, uh, we can't put the onus on them completely. So, with that, we'll, we'll talk about some of these different techniques. I mean, egg freezing is especially applicable to, um, to oncology type patients because we often, uh, patients are young, they don't have partners, um, they don't have husbands, uh, so they're more interested in egg freezing versus embryo freezing. This is just an old picture from, from actually a friend of mine that I went to medical school with who uh, works at um, Brigham and Women's in Boston, and he was the guy who pioneered egg freezing, uh, as it turns out, I didn't know that, uh, I didn't think he was that smart. <laughs> it and uh, lots of work. But you know, this is just a picture from one of his slides, and in one of the uh, one of the methods that we used to use for uh, you know, what we call slow freezing, which now we don't do, but um, just some eggs that are in, in the process of being frozen there. Um, you know, now we use a process called vitrification, which is a rapid cooling and freezing, um, and as it turns out. This just shows from 2008 some of the success rates, which are really improved.
express it to be, and it basically says that frozen eggs that survive the thaw, roughly 95%, it, it's just a massive improvement, uh, and that was you know, four or five years, uh, six years ago. And um, it, it's just as good now, and this was uh, early information, but roughly 75% of those thawed eggs that survive, 75% of them uh, then fertilize. Um, and roughly 35, 40% will implant, um, and the ongoing pregnancy rate is 60%. I mean, that's just amazing. Um, I mean, that rivals anything with respect to egg donor or you know, young and healthy patients that uh, with a fresh embryo transfer. I mean, it's just impressive. And, you know, these were early statistics from one study, but as it turns out, I mean, it's pretty much born true over the period of half dozen years. So it's an effective, it's an effective tool. Embryo freezing is another option and you know of course if the patient has a, a sperm source, whether it be sperm donor uh, or a partner or a husband, um, you know, whatever the case may be, um, embryo uh, crowd preservation is the preferred method. It's tried and true. Egg, embryo freezing we've been doing forever. Egg freezing we've been doing a long time but really more than a half, last half dozen years better. Embryo freezing is tried and true for you know, 15 years or 20 years or more. Um, and you know, this just shows that you know, the impact, one of the reasons is premature ovarian dysfunction that I described, patients with low reserve, patients with a family history of premature menopause. I mean, these, uh, it's a very effective method of preserving current and future fertility for them. And this just shows um, how the fertility um, declines over time and age, um, and miscarriages increase overall leading to a lower live birth rate. Um, embryo ground preservation or freezing can be a, a, an effective method to combat that. This is just a cool picture that shows how the freezing is. <laughs> <laughs> um, th this is a, a, another method, the tissue, ovarian tissue crown preservation. This is, you know, I wouldn't say it's experimental, but it's certainly new. It, it's really for a niche uh, group of patients. It's not something that we uh, often see as, as of interest to people. There's a lot of issues on what to do when you go to thaw the tissue out. Sometimes it's really all we have. And most specifically when we have patients who uh, have breast cancer or for some other reason are having the ovary removed, we can take the ovary, extract the, the cortical tissue, the outside rim, where the eggs are, we're able to preserve that in little strips uh, and freeze that. There's another cool, that same cool freezing picture. Uh, but, you know, this is a, a very useful method, but honestly, it's not something that is uh, applicable to a large number of patients. If you're getting the ovary removed, then it's, it's often uh, sort of a plan B to say, why not? You know, uh, we can do this now. You know, obviously, there's a lot of issues upon the thaw in the future. This just describes how we use Lupron uh, or GnRH agonists for fertility preservation. We do this a lot, and it's again uh, sort of a plan B. Patient gets a bunch of eggs retrieved. We sort of shut down uh, the ovaries uh, and induce, if you will, an artificial menopause where their estrogen level is very low. And this is, this is we believe, helpful. Respect to estrogen sensitive tumors, um, namely breast cancer, of course, again. But it's sort of uh, controversial whether it actually helps preserve ovarian function. So, again, it's not something that we use as a primary method, but more of an adjunct to the more tried and true things like egg and embryo freezing and, and again, secondarily, tissue freezing. We use the Lupron because it's cheap, it's easy, it's applicable to pretty much everybody who's premenopausal. And, and it has uh, very few drawbacks. The question is, it's debatable on how effective it is to actually preserve eggs, uh, which is the primary goal. And that 
that said, we do it a lot uh, because it's just easy. Um, and patients are, are, you know, may perceive some benefit with respect to the breast cancer and estrogen receptor tumor, <coughs> estrogen receptor positive tumors. So that's that's the last uh, of the uh, of the uh, preservation techniques that we have. So.